Artist Timothy Ray touched many lives over the years as a professor at Minnesota State University Moorhead. He's most remembered for the critiques and guidance that he provided to students. His own practice included a mixture of abstract printmaking, papermaking, and painting. Timothy lost his battle to cancer in February of 2013, but his art remains a memory of his dedicated passion. There came a point where you could see the acceleration of his illness, but I think that he was the last person that would tell himself to stop um, because this was something that he had done his entire life, and the process was really part of his nature. It was like eating a meal, um, he would be in the studio. He was a very particular personality. He was kind of ironic and witty. He was, I think, counted on for being, um, being honest with people. He was always really involved in the local art scene and the regional art scene, uh, both through the Plains Art Museum and the Rourke Art Museum. What Tim was most known for was his acrylic collages. He didn't limit himself, and that was one thing that was really interesting about his work, is that he was able to not be confined by his style. He was able to explore, in some ways, um, this geometric feeling with this emotional tie to his past. Well, I always say that I can't remember, you know, not, not drawing and painting. When it came time to go to university, I couldn't imagine succeeding at anything except art. And that got me really into the teaching field more than anything else. He was a teacher, so he taught basic design and color and all that sort of thing. But, you know, people said that one of the things that they remember is the critiques in how they would not only, you know, do their, their painting, but they would have group critiques and individual critiques. He made sure that they had outside influence as well. So he would take groups to Minneapolis or other places, you know, make sure that students got to the various shows at the galleries and museums here. If he was in town where he knew a former student was at, he would make sure that he got in touch with them. And, you know, they would go talk about art and go to museums and shows. He was, um, you know, a very friendly guy, but at the same time, he had things to do. When people walked in the door, if he wasn't expecting them and if he was involved in painting, he would be pretty brusque. But if he ever had his apron on, we knew he was at work. He uh, actually got uh, involved in a show at the Rourke. They had his work on the walls, and then um, for a couple weeks, he was working in residence there painting. I did it, and then that was followed by maybe half a dozen other, other artists. I was really, I think all those exhibitions were really interesting. I'm very proud of the fact that I was the person who said to Jim, you know, you should really go back to the idea of artists working. It was actually called Artist at Work, and he didn't really like demonstrating because he never really got work done, but he kind of figured it out after a while, you know, because people wanted to see him at work, and, uh, and so he did, you know, figure that out finally. <laughs> but it took him, what, 50 some years. <laughs> you expect good technique. You expect neatness and orderliness in anything. Abstract art is an offense against neatness. The thing about technique is everybody thinks that what the technique is is trying to match the marks on the canvas to something out in reality. Like, did you try to make this look like a duck or a naked lady or a still life? The abstract artists can say, you know, I'm really not trying to do that. People who do that are a little stupid anyway, aren't they? Because you could take a picture of that. If you can get that kind of reality, you know, you better come up with a better idea. What's interesting about his work is that it's not immediately recognizable what it is. People, even if they don't know his history, when they look at his work, for example, this piece near Hecla, they have a feeling that it's a harbor or just because of the color itself, they have a feeling of the ocean. It's almost like this, an artificial um, like feeling to it from the eye, but then you have the forms make this um, almost kite-like reference. And I think that that's, that theme has been kind of played with throughout his work. It's just, you know, me and the materials and Lady Luck. That's all there is to it. Actually, I never said that before. I think that's a good line, don't you? I'm going to use that again.
later in his career, things became um, more difficult for him. We wanted to help him through this time, but also celebrate his life simultaneously. So there were many mixes of emotions. With the retrospective too, the retrospective, which we combined with the North Dakota Museum of Art, the sense of urgency was there. And, and unfortunately, with this illness, it accelerated at a, a, a pace that was hard for Tim to keep up with. The last two weeks of his life, he was really failing. You know, so people just stepped in and, and did it. It's really pretty sweet. We had been working so hard to produce this retrospective, and, and it was Tim's intention to be there for that. He died February 9th, and then, and then the, the show opened the 17th. We had people coming from all over the country. Not everyone made the opening, but throughout that month, we had former students and former colleagues or whatever it was that I, I don't know if Tim even realized that he had touched them in a way that he did, and his style had such an effect on what they produced or how they lived. Prairie Mosaic is funded by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund with money from the vote of the people of Minnesota on November 4, 2008. The North Dakota Council on the Arts and by the members of Prairie Public.